This week's On Story, Jurassic Park writer David Kapp. If you let yourself be defined by a success, then you must also let yourself be defined by the failure. And the truth is, you are neither your successes nor your failures, but rather the sum total of everything. In this episode, the critically acclaimed writer of Jurassic Park, Mission Impossible, Panic Room, and Spider-Man, David Kep, talks about jumping between genres and working with famed director Steven Spielberg. Was storytelling always the, the passion that you had? When did you kind of think about writing as something you wanted to do as a living? I, I started acting in high school, um, and... I loved it. I was in a lot of high school plays, and I, I, I had been writing... I started writing little stories when I was, like, 12 years old that were usually about, you know, some kid who was misunderstood and, uh, uh, you know, had some, then had some adventure. And then it would become about a 14-year-old who was misunderstood and had an adventure, and an 18-year-old who, you know, women didn't understand, but he went off and had an adventure. And those were always fun to write, and, but they were just for fun. And in high school, I would write short stories and things. So it was always something I wanted to do. You know, I was always very into suspense stories. Hitchcock movies were a very big deal for me as a kid. So I was into suspense and horror, and James Cameron was, I think I was 22 when Aliens came out. And so as uh, Spielberg had been to me for, for my, you know, late teens and early 20s, I mean, the time, between the time I was 14 and 18, the seminal movies were Jaws, Close Encounters, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and E.T. I, I mean, it's just this incredible run. You can't be my age and have wanted to be a, a filmmaker or a screenwriter and not been massively influenced. How did you, I guess, find that first real step with your peers and getting something on the screen? Everything that has ever advanced me has been because I wrote something on spec. So the first thing that I had worked on that it got made was called Apartment Zero, which was a small independent movie. It was an idea that an Argentine director named Martin Donovan had. And he, um, he I, was, I did an internship in film school for sort of a disreputable uh, gig. You know, we represented some foreign titles for sale and we bought like B and C movies for uh, distribution in foreign countries. So like, I actually got to go to film markets, which was fascinating and buy, um, you know, we'd buy like Sorority House Massacre 3 for Belgium, you know. So I met Martin who had an independent film. He was trying to, uh, my boss was trying to help him sell it. And Martin and I hit it off uh, just because we were so different. I was. 24-year-old, you know, small-town kid from the Midwest, and he was 14 years older than me and from, you know, Buenos Aires. You, you, and it was just a great clash of styles. So then we, we, we got money together. Uh, my boss helped us, uh, you know, raise a little money. We raised some on our own. We ended up putting in our own money in classic, ill-advised fashion. And we made that movie for about a million two. Senor Le Duc. Senor Sanchez Byrne found mice in his apartment. Well, twice is that true. Don't tell lies. Now you've been going on about these mice all the time. We think the whole building may be infested. Uh, there are no mice in my apartment. But you can't really be sure, can you? We think the exterminator should do the whole building. Mice work in mysterious ways. Oh, dear, that's God. So that was my first movie. By no means a, um, a profitable venture, but it's a very good movie, and it got some notice, and more importantly, it uh, developed confidence and experience. What was uh, seeing that movie on the screen with an audience for the first time like? Was that the first time you had a, an audience of unknowns watch your work? Oh, yeah, it's amazing. It, it, it was... And again, I was very young when I started. I'm, my story is not, it's hard to like me when I tell it because particularly for my 20s, things, things I was just this soul for whom things fell together and worked extremely well and, you know. And trust me, later in life, I would suffer mightily and I've had, I've had terrible things happen to me, so it's okay. Major flops and disasters would come later, and those are also worth talking about, actually more worth talking about. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't want to talk about a flop right yet. I, I, what I, we will. <laughs> but I do want to talk about one of the earlier movies in your career that's one of my favorites, which is Death Becomes Her, which is so weird and so cool 
and so different and something like we wouldn't I don't think, ever see today. I'm curious how a movie like that comes together, what that pitch looks like. So that was the other script I wrote with Martin Donovan. We had, we'd done Apartment Zero, and I'd then gone off and done this movie, Bad Influence, and I had this idea I wanted to do uh, four horror stories set in an apartment building, you know, and each, each place had a different horror story in it. And I'd come up with this one, I had this idea that this woman was a witch who had developed, a, you know, something where she couldn't be uh, killed, and, and then her husband, who despises her, kills her, but she doesn't die. So not only do you have now a bad marriage, but you have a bad marriage in which you murdered the person and they're still there to give you a hard time about it, which I thought could be quite funny. Um, and so did he. So we started working on that, and then we realized, well, the yeah, the three stories. We got, you know, these, this is fun. So we wrote it anticipating it would be maybe a $5 million movie. We thought Apartment Zero was sort of Grand Guignol, and we thought this might be along the same lines, but funnier, and an indie for about $5 million. So we went out looking for producers and help and things. And at the time, then, I had started working at Universal because they were going to make Bad Influence, but they wanted to make it into a comedy. And I said, no, that's, that's a thriller. Let's leave it alone. And they said, say, I like this. Casey Silver at Universal said, I like this kid's moxie. He said, no. So he hired me to like an overall thing. And I said, if you want funny, I got a funny one. Um, and so I sent him that and they, they bought it. They bought it never intending to do anything with it because it was so weird. But they thought it was cheap and funny and maybe. So then it was at Universal and we did a draft and got it better and changed some things and you know, it was, it, but it was still very bizarre. Um, and they sent it in a pile of scripts to Bob Zemeckis um, because he had just done the, the last two Back to the Futures for them and they desperately wanted him to, you know, quickly do something else. And of all the stuff he read, <laughs> I think this was the last one they were hoping that he would do. And because Casey called me and said, so <laughs> he said, so good news. He said, um, there's a director who wants to do your movie. It's Bob Zemeckis. And he said it was such disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> like you've really screwed us. Uh, we wanted him to do the babe and, uh, which they had. And, um, anyway, so Bob came in and uh, you, you know, to lapse into Bob's vernacular, it turned into this, this thing that just, 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 I don't know, I don't know, but it's going to be great. And then it, so it, it ended up having far more resources and much bigger actors than we anticipated, but it was just, I love that movie because it's so bonkers. Ernest, Ernest, you pushed me down the stairs. <laughs> You bet I will. Animal. Psycho. Don't come near me. Wife. Pusher. Don't come near me or follow me. Don't come near me or follow me or talk to me. I don't intend to. I just have to make a telephone call. Well, I kind of want to uh, go back to something you just said, which was the, the moxie of saying no. What's your take on how, on now, and I guess back then as well, when to stick to your guns, when to compromise, like how did you navigate that in order to retain your own voice but find your way in the industry? What defines you as any kind of popular artist is when am I saying no to something because it's not a good idea or it's not right for this? And when am I saying no to something uh, because it's just not mine, it's not my idea. This pertains more to notes. Um, and sometimes you reject stuff because it's, it's just not your idea and you just get cranky. I have a 48 hour period of rage after hearing any notes. And then, you know, and I just gotta wait it out and then I get through it and I'm like, oh, actually that's not such a terrible idea. And then conversely, when are you saying yes because it's actually a good idea? And when are you saying yes because it's easier than fighting? And those are tough questions that you have every single day from the moment your script gets out of the house um, with the larger world. But I think saying no to a studio, in that, in that case, it wasn't that hard for me because I didn't have any money at the time and they were offering money, but it was a well-written thriller. 
And I, I heard that from a number of sources, you know, that it was working. And they wanted to make it a buddy comedy. And I just, I couldn't see a way to do it. I just didn't, I was like, I, I hear you, and I bet that would be a funny buddy comedy. I don't see how to do it. So it's very binary. If I, if I see like, oh, I, can, I have an idea how I might do that, great. If I don't, it's pointless. It's, it's, you're just going to bang your head against the wall. So back to Death Becomes Her, how does that actually perform? That was my first, yeah, studio movie. Definitely by far the biggest. Um, I'd done those two indies, Bad Influence and Apartment Zero. Uh, Death Becomes Her did fine. The previews were disasters because it, it's a black comedy and they just don't test. Hold out your hand. Watch. Because it's just too dark, and people are like, yeah, I, no, that was, oh, I, yeah, no, I love that, but no. No, you can't do it. So, and then they were, again, Universal was surprised because it came out and it actually opened well. And I remember, like, the Variety review said, you know, daring, bonkers, and way, way, way over the top. <laughs> Okay, fine. And we were like, all right. Um, so, but then it, it held on, you know, because it has a distinctive character um, to it. What doors does that open? I guess what's, first of all, like where, where are you headed from here now that you have this under your belt? Spielberg, Steven Spielberg was looking, like I gotta add his first name, was looking for a right, somebody new and frankly cheap to take a crack at um, Jurassic Park because they'd, had, they'd tried a couple drafts and it wasn't working, but he knew he really wanted to make the movie. So they said, will you read this and, and, and meet with Steven and, and tell him how you might do it? And I said, okay, but as a favor. <laughs> <laughs> so I read it and, you know, it's a remarkable book and it's dense with science. It's a really daunting adaptation. If you read it, you're like, ugh, I get when they're running around eating people, but this part where the guy talks about math for 12 pages is tough. But I had some ideas about that, and I, so I went and met Stephen and pitched my thoughts and ideas to him on it, and um, that got made, and this is where the story, this, see, this is the nauseating part, because, uh, you know, so then that gets made and it's the biggest movie of all time and I was 29 years old. For both Carlito's Way and for uh, Jurassic Park, you are adapting for uh, a force, De Palma and Spielberg. I mean, what kind of pressures are, are you under for that? Is this something where you are feeling confident in yourself? It's a lot. You got to feel like you belong in the room um, and you don't yet, you know? So Brian is very disarming immediately and um, he's also quite fatalistic and funny and, and dark, as you might imagine. And so I found it easier to work with him immediately. Stephen is fabulous to work with, and we have done since then many times. But it's hard to get over, again, my formative years were all his movies. So to, to feel like you, gotta be, you deserve to be in the room and that your viewpoint is valid and important is it, it requires some egotism that's hard to come up with right away. The biggest thing that I think I brought was how can I reasonably structure this? What characters should be combined or eliminated? At what points should these fabulous set pieces that you have in mind occur and who should be in them, you know? And what do they say to each other? I did feel that it was important that, that there be humor in the movie, so I tried to bring that in, but not to such an extent that it was gonna ruin the suspense or horror. So that in that regard, Jeff Goldblum was extremely helpful. Anybody hear that? It's a, um, it's an impact armor is what it is. I'm fairly alarmed here. Come on, come on, come on, come on. We gotta get out of here. Gotta get out of here. Now, now, right now. Go, 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 go. let's go. Hey. Must go faster. Movies that come together and turn out to be 
memorable and stick around. Um, and Jurassic Park certainly is one of those. They're lightning in a bottle, and they're not just because one person was did something brilliant. It's because there were seven or eight people who all were at the very top of their game, and they were with the right material. So on that, obviously, Crichton started the whole thing, and he's at the top of his you know science thriller uh, imagination. Stephen, you know, flexing his ridiculously powerful visual storytelling muscles. And, the, you know, the three actors who, uh, Laura Dern, Sam Neill, and Jeff Goldblum, who are all doing some of their best work ever. What does that type of success look like when you have a movie that is to that level of a phenomenon? What does that do to you? That's a, that's a heads up question. Uh, I won't say it's not fun. <laughs> um, there, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I remember I was in New York because we were shooting Carlito's Way when it came out, and um, I walked down to the Ziegfeld. In, you know, this was the old days when you, you hear about grosses if, you know, Sid from the studio calls and says, the grosses are good, kid. Um, so I walked down to the Ziegfeld on Friday night to see how it was doing, and they, there was the guy came out and said, the, uh, the 7 o'clock showing of Jurassic Park is sold out. And this big line of people goes, oh. And I was like, yeah, all right, that's, that's, that's really promising. And, uh, and he said, also, the 10 o'clock showing of Jurassic Park is sold out. And they went, ah. Oh. And he said, tomorrow night's 7 o'clock and 10 o'clock shows are also sold out. And I thought, oh, that's, that's good. I, I know I'm new here. <laughs> And then it was, of course, good, and then it held on really remarkably. So what it does is it f***s you up because there's wonderful things that come up. You know, there's, there's money, industry prestige, the ability to work on other things, um, chance to maybe pursue some of the stuff that, you know, some of your original stuff you want to do, and that's great. And, of course, everyone who worked on the movie together loves each other. You know, if you have a flop, you see each other, you act like you owe each other money. <laughs> so, but, you know, so there's all that. And, you know, but life will not continue that way. And a lot of, a lot of what's, I think, important to happen to you in your, in your teens and 20s is you need to have significant hardship so that you're ready for it when it comes later in life. And because professionally and at that time personally, everything was going so relentlessly well for me, I had to learn later in life how to deal with adversity. And so I think, you know, there's what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, right? It may also weaken you to the point where you die. Um, but bad, you know, tough things that happen to us and struggle that occurs m does make us not only um, a stronger person, but a more... Uh, uh, empathetic one, and uh, the, that learning for me was to come later, and it's harder when it comes later. So Hollywood success is, I moved out of Hollywood in my mid-30s, um, and have been in New York since, which is, was, was, was very helpful, because it's a very one-topic town, and when you're up, it's great, and when you're down, not so much, and it's, um, it's not good for you. Uh, so learning, learning to look elsewhere in life and that there is other, uh, are other aspects of life and that if you, if you let yourself, if you let yourself be defined by a success, then you must also let yourself be defined by the failure. And the truth is you are neither your successes nor your failures, but rather the sum total of everything. Right. I've uh, had therapy. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it seems that at that point you, Obviously with Jurassic Park, and, but then with Spider-Man and Indiana Jones and The Da Vinci Code and Jack Ryan, you have become someone where people are going to just hand you franchises and trust you with the franchises. It depends. They're not the most fun way to spend your time. Um, they're really hard, uh, especially doing, if it's not the first of something, like the firsts that I did of of things that went on to be, you know, franchises or multiple movies like um you know Jurassic or Mission Impossible or um, Spider-Man those are a great deal of fun because there's no guarantee it's going to work there's no preconceptions comic book movies were 
you know, that they were, that was slumming. I mean, the idea that, that Sony was going to spend $100 million on a comic book movie was insane. The X-Men came out while we were shooting, I think. And, and it was a big, you know, it was like, hey, wait a minute. If you take it seriously and write these characters as sensitively as you can, these, these, can, be, these can be quite popular and good. Was that already your approach when you were writing Spider-Man? Yeah, we wanted to, I, my pitch, because I did have to pitch on Spider-Man, they were very, you know, particular. And so I had all these boards of things I liked from the books that I, you know, comic books, panels and storylines I wanted to follow. And I went in and I said, here's the thing, I want to take, because the, the, the customary thing to do was get the origin out of the way in as little time as possible, um, you know, and have a happy ending. And I said... I want it to be about 45 minutes before he's actually Spider-Man. And he, he and MJ can't be together at the end. It's gotta be heartbreaking. So where are you going after you graduate? I, uh, I wanna move into the city and hopefully uh, get a job as a photographer, work my way through college. What about you? Headed for the city, too. Can't wait to get out of here. And then I had, like, the storyline I wanted to do with Harry and, you know, um, the love triangle and stuff. But I said, um, that's the thing. You gotta, if you hire me, you gotta sign on. It's gonna take forever for him to become Spider-Man because we gotta just love this guy desperately and see, understand him and feel his, feel his pain. And at the end, there's, he's, there's no way they can be together. Um, because then it's then it's over, and you don't want it to be over. Yeah, you know, what occurs to me when you're saying that is that this sounds a lot like the first stories you were writing as a kid of like the misunderstood kid who has trouble with the girls and finds it in the misunderstood teenager and things like that. There's a that's there's a there's a reason we you know identify with those people who doesn't feel misunderstood. So yeah, to write a, a, a teenager who didn't feel like he was getting the understanding or attention he deserved from his peers and particularly women was not far afield for me. Curious, looking back at your career now, if there's a specific character, a specific scene, a specific moment that maybe you're most fond of, most proud of. I directed this movie called Ghost Town that, that oh, thank you, that is a very sweet and heartfelt because I wrote it in a period after I'd gone through some difficulty and I had fallen in love and was to marry this woman that I've been married to now for 20 years. And that story came out of that era of this John Camps, my co-writer, often in on that. And I wanted to write a story of, of someone who was truly, <clears throat> truly awful to people and slowly awaken his better nature. And there's a moment at the end, it has an ending, he's a dentist. And uh, this is a, uh, the woman he's in love with, Tay Leone, has has a had a terrible tooth problem throughout the movie. At the end, he said, uh, she's come back after a long time and sees him and he's sitting in his thing and very heartfelt, tragic story between them. And um, she, she says, it hurts when I smile. It hurts when I smile. And he says, I can fix that. I can fix that for you. Which I just thought was lovely. I got those, and, and, and it was so nice getting Ricky Gervais, who brilliantly plays the guy, to that moment. I think I ran 10 minutes of film on him, just that last couple lines, until there was one that was lovely. You've been watching a conversation with David Kep on On Story. On Story is part of a growing number of programs in Austin Film Festival's On Story project that also includes the On Story radio program, podcast, book series, and the On Story archive, accessible through the Whitliff Collections at Texas State University. To find out more about OnStory and Austin Film Festival, visit onstory.tv or austinfilmfestival.com. See On Story Live? 
Join us at Austin Film Festival's annual Writers' Conference each October. Visit www.austinfilmfestival.com to find out more about badges and passes to attend the festival.